Joining us now from the Johnson Space Center is Deke Slayton. He's a former astronaut from Project Mercury. Uh, I must confess, Deke, that I can never think of you as anything other than Commander Slayton because I covered you during the Apollo Soyuz when you linked up with the Soviets. You've heard that criticism from some members on Capitol Hill today. Too much PR, commercial pressure on the Apollo program, on the shuttle program. What's your answer? Well, I can't evaluate that, uh, Peter. I don't think there's too much pressure. Obviously, uh, NASA wants to get off on schedule, but I think the things that have happened have been uh, good judgment. They've delayed when it made sense to delay. The problems they've had on the ground are the kind you want to have on the ground, and uh, I don't think they've panicked into this flight. Uh, the PR part, obviously, NASA needs PR to keep their programs going, and uh, this isn't the kind of PR you need, obviously, to have a successful program, but it's been said many other times this evening, that's the price you pay for progress, and we're just going to have to get our marbles back in the sack here and figure out what happened and get on with it. Well, I don't want to be too callous about this, but even though this is an enormous tragedy for the nation, I'm very struck by how the nation's young people were engaged in this mission, largely because of Krista McAuliffe. In some respects, this may regenerate interest and support for the program, mightn't it? I think that's very possible. I think people have gotten blase. They've presumed that we're going to have 100% success always, and I think people have to recognize that every element of this program involves people, and there isn't any perfect people around this universe, unfortunately. So it's inevitable, as John Glenn said, it was going to happen. It was just a question of when. And I think maybe there is a message there, and the young folks are going to understand it, and hopefully it'll cause them to work harder, to study harder, and uh, to do good work, as old Gus Grissom used to say, and make this thing work right. Do you have any answers tonight, or any partial answers that NASA has not given us because it doesn't want to go public at the moment? No, I don't. I, like everyone else, have observed the uh, tapes a number of times, and uh, my personal opinion, if I was forced to make one, would be that it's start looking somewhere around the engines, because most failures happen when something's in a transient stage, the engines were in a power-up stage from 65 to 104 percent, and uh, that to me would be a likely place to look first, but that doesn't mean that there's any more than a 50-50 chance that's the real problem. Lynn Scher in California has a question for you. Uh, Deke, uh, you were there during the other horrible NASA accident, the uh, Apollo fire. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how long it took, not the program to get back on track, because we know the numbers involved with that, but but what happens to your head when that happens to people you know and work with and when you're slated to go up in a similar machine? Well, as you know, Lynn, I was uh, in charge of the crews at that time and sitting in the blockhouse. Well, it was kind of a personal blow. But uh, like a lot of other mistakes and catastrophes, including this one, uh, you hope to learn from it. And I think we learned a lot from that particular one that's not only benefited the space program, but uh, a lot of peripheral industries. Your airliners today are much safer because of that accident. We discovered we had flammable materials, we had a bad atmosphere to be working with, and uh, we've taken advantage of that knowledge and spread it off across the total economy. And, and those are the kind of things you hope you get out of it. You don't want these kind of catastrophes to have happened in vain. Can you give you us... want it to be worthwhile. Can you give us some sense of hard numbers? When Grissom Chafee and White were killed in that fire on the pad in 67. The program, as we said, was delayed by 22 months. And there is commercial right. pressure and there is military pressure on the shuttle program. What does this do to that? Oh, the pressure's still there, but I don't think anybody's going to do anything stupid. They're going to have a highly qualified board to look into this thing properly. They'll try to find out what exactly happened. If they're lucky, they will. If they're unlucky, they won't, and they'll have to do a shotgun fix like we've done in the past. Uh, fix everything that might have caused the problem, and that'll obviously take longer. But I'm firmly convinced that we will find out what the problem was, it'll get fixed, and we'll continue on with the space program, and we'll all be smarter for it. And some things won't happen as fast as uh, people had hoped they would yesterday, but uh, they will Deke, happen. Uh, let me ask you a question that I suspect you do not want to answer, which is, uh, what about from a strictly personal point of view? Is it a question of just getting back on the horse? How, do, how does one, as an astronaut, convince oneself to go back in a different machine? Well, that's easy. I've, I've been in this business about 45 years, and I've had people blown off my wing and disposed of in other various un, 
unsavory ways, and uh, you all we'll always get back in the cockpit and go. That's what we're paid for, and that's kind of the price of the ticket, to be up there and have fun and do things that are challenging and important. And uh, I don't think any of us in the business look at it any other way. Commander, or Deke, as, as many people do know you, I continue to know you as Commander, thank you for joining us this evening. And, and it is indeed worth pointing out that uh, this catastrophe occurs after 24 successful missions of the space shuttle program. And while it raises the questions today of the viability of a manned program in space uh, versus an unmanned program, uh, you cannot help but get the impression that the overwhelming sentiment uh, both in the Congress and at the White House, and clearly with the people in the space program, uh, that the manned space program can, will, and must go forward. Joining us tonight from our Washington bureau is ABC's commentator, George Will. George, I know you have some thoughts on, uh, on today and, and what it means in terms of both the world out there and the real world we live in. Peter, this was to be the teacher's mission that combined something that Americans believe in very much, science, and the old simple schoolroom. It was to be an orbiting schoolroom. And in a terrible and cruel sense, it was just that. The nation today was taken abruptly and harshly back to school and taught a few things. The legacy of this mission, and those seven people certainly did not die without a legacy, is a heightened, renewed appreciation of the terrific heroism of the people in the space program who are dealing with very violent forces, with a very small margin of error, and doing it brilliantly. A recurring theme today, Peter, has been that the space program has become almost too good for its own good, in the sense that it's a bit like DiMaggio. He was such a graceful man, made so many things look so easy, the people began to not appreciate him anymore. People will now have a quickened sense of this. Congressman Brown said a minute ago he thought this was a setback for the program. I disagree. I think this will cruelly, at a terrible price, purchase for the space program the kind of appreciation that the country owes it. Furthermore, it teaches the country again the high price of progress. The history of progress, Peter, has been the progress of turning very risky things into very routine things. When we started to build in this country bridges and dams, a lot of bridges and dams fell down and a lot of people died. A lot of trains crashed and planes crashed until we got to be routine about flying across the country. This is a step, a costly step, in making something dangerous routine, and I think we shall. George, I want to jog your memory a little because you haven't said it yet, but I think I know you wanted to say it. And that is the connection between these people who died in space today doing a job and other Americans doing a job all over the world tonight. So can I jog your memory on what you wanted to say? You're quite right. Most of us, Peter, most of the time, live in blissful ignorance of what a small, elite, heroic group of Americans are doing for us night and day. As we speak, under the oceans, American submariners are doing something very dangerous. People will say, well, it can't be dangerous because there are no wrecks. Well, in the first place, we lost a submarine a few years ago. But more than that, the reason we don't have more accidents is that these are superb professionals. But the fact that they master the dangers do not does not mean the dangers aren't real. As we speak, Peter, somewhere around the world, young men are landing high-performance jet aircraft on the pitching decks of aircraft carriers at night. You can't pay people to do that. They do it out of love, of country, of adventure, of the challenge. We all benefit from it, and the very fact that we don't have to think about it tells you how superbly they're doing their job, living on the edge of danger, so the rest of us need not think about, let alone experience danger. George, Will, thank you very much for joining us. Of all the things, I must tell you a very personal observation that has struck me today in, in all the phraseology that has been used about the heroism of the people in space, so far I think it's this line from James Michener in some respects, who said in all of the talk he had with all of the astronauts in the space program and the research for writing his novel, he never talked to them about fear. This also appears to have been one of those incidents which get so indelibly marked in people's imagination that they remember where they were, as so many of us remember where we were on the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, where we might not remember where we were on another uh, catastrophic occasion. This was one of those days, and as we said at the beginning of the broadcast, this has affected the nation, all across the nation, in big towns and little towns, cities, villages. Everybody has shared in it, in part because so many of us saw it. Here's ABC's Bill Blakemore. In classrooms around the country today, with someone from the classroom world lifting off, it was as if they all were. 
What do you think? Oh, my God. Goodness. What are you feeling? Goosebumps all over. Yeah. James I... Rowley was a semifinalist in NASA's yeah. Teacher in Space selection. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. My director confirms that we are uh, looking at uh, checking with the recovery forces to see uh, what can be done at this point. Can we, can we get the cameras? Brought in for the New Age's first formal classroom lessons from outer space, our children were suddenly taught instead the old lessons of mortality. Of the real risk which gives any victories their meaning. Well, I was really amazed to see it because I never thought um, explosion would really ever happen. I was pretty scared because I thought it could have been my science teacher that was going to be hurt in it. A finalist in the teacher selection. It's something that'll take a long time for people to get over, but I really feel that it's worth every effort to continue the space program. Hey, space shuttle explode, get it right now. In the streets and stores across America today, that same feeling in the gut we had known before. Well, I think it's very tragic. I think it's the most tragic thing since the death of Kennedy himself. Before I got the same sick kind of feeling that I used to get when I was in Vietnam. Just a, just a horrible feeling. That feeling that you get, that cold feeling all over that only happens maybe five times in your lifetime. We were all set up for it, watching this shuttle flight especially, because this time the space age was really going to begin. One of us was going, not just a teacher but a mother, a private citizen, your neighbor. That's very upset. After all that about Kristen McAuliffe, it's almost as if you know her. Today, in the United States military and scientific communities which built the space program, the professionals tried to handle their losses. And today, it's a very somber, uh, grave-like situation here. The uh, NASA public affairs officer with us was in tears because he had worked with these people. <clears throat> and uh, it is very close, and we're all feeling it. And I really find it very hard to talk about it. People are kind of uh, numb, just uh, shocked. One of the first, Chuck Yeager, who conquered the sound barrier. You don't give an awful lot of thought to it because, number one, you can't do anything about it when it happens. And the newest, Purdue University students hoping to join the space effort. Oh, hey, there are risks involved, and being an astronaut is not this little little dream. It's, uh, it, it's a job, and it's, it has risks, and there are dangers involved. A memorial flame was lit in the Los Angeles Olympic Stadium. Our national space effort lost innocence. The challengers learned of death. We will travel in space, but now none of us will take it for granted. Peter? Bill, we mentioned earlier the uh, eloquence of the president today, who is so vital to the nation on an occasion like this, as we see in Bill Blakemore's piece, someone who can somehow crystallize the emotion that uh, so much of the nation is feeling. The president reminded us today that on this very date, 390 years ago, the great explorer Sir Francis Drake, the first man to circumnavigate the globe, died when his ship was wrecked off the coast of Panama. An incredible jump in 390 years from circumnavigating the globe to searching for the heavens. A great many words today. It seems that on occasions like this, a lot of the talk seems to act, have a cathartic effect on the nation as a whole. Some final thoughts now, perhaps, from ABC's Lynn Schur, who covers space for us and is in California tonight. Lynn? Peter, I feel as if personally and professionally I have felt the absolute peak and the absolute depth of the American space program this week. The success, of course, of Voyager's trip to Uranus and the horror of Challenger's explosion. John Glenn said with sorrow that perhaps NASA isn't perfect. Well, perhaps if humans are meant to fly in space, perhaps NASA needs to be perfect. On the other hand, uh, maybe that is simply the risk of confronting the future. In any event, the next few weeks, the next few months are going to be critical not only in terms of America's space program, but in terms of the future of NASA itself. Lynn, thank you very much for your uh, stoic work today. Your mention of John Glenn, I guess, reminds us of the, of the enduring quality that being an astronaut can have, covering John Glenn in the presidential campaign. Um, he doesn't like to hear this, I guess, but it's inevitable. Covering him, I think it was in a supermarket in Iowa, and people not recognizing him as a presidential candidate, as he would like them to do, but people rushing up to him 
and in many cases bringing their children to him and saying, we named this child, this boy child, after you, John Glenn, because you were the first man to completely circle the globe. And it stays with him always.